guys and welcome back to another episode of heebie tv my name is ashley and if you're new here we like to talk about crime creepy and unbelievable stories so if that's your thing don't forget to comment like subscribe or even share this video it really does help me grow here on youtube and if you guys want more short story format head over to my tiktok i post on there one two even three times a day a lot more content on there so if that's your thing go ahead and check it out i will leave the link in the description box for you guys Okay, so today's story, we're going to go back to true crime. And this was a story that I was actually quite shocked to hear about because it is a Canadian crime. And I'm Canadian myself, if you guys didn't know that. And I was extremely surprised to hear that I had not really heard about this story. I had seen this young lady's photo floating around, but I never... For some reason, I just never looked into the story up until I heard a lot of people talking about it again. So recently, a news article came out saying that Netflix was going to do a documentary on this story and also based on the book that was written about it shortly after it happened. And so I started looking into the crime and I was absolutely horrified about what happened to this girl and her name was Rena Verk. So let's get into the story. Now, this story actually takes us to a place called Saanich in Victoria, which is located on Vancouver Island. You would think a beautiful place like Saanich would have been the ideal place to raise a family because it is beautiful, it's quiet, it's close to nature. Most people would consider it to be kind of like a safe haven, but for Rena, unfortunately, it was everything but that. So Rena was born on March 10th, 1983 in Saanich. Her parents were Manjeet Verk and Suman Verk. Her father Manjeet was a newly immigrated Indian to Canada and her mother was actually from an Indo-Canadian family who had actually just recently converted from Hinduism to Jehovah's Witnesses. And this will play a role later on in the story. However, this huge switch in religion was so out of the ordinary it was kind of considered to be out of left field because you don't see that every day in an indian family and it was considered to be such an odd transition that people in the community or even other people that would later read about the story would go on to call her family a minority within a minority so Rena was the oldest of her siblings and she also had a younger sister and a younger brother and her family actually lived in a neighborhood called View Royal, which was considered to be predominantly Caucasian and a middle class suburb. Although Rena's family did their absolute best to give her a good upbringing, they were also said to have been quite strict and a lot of this had to do with their religion being Jehovah's Witnesses. In addition to that, if you didn't know, being a Jehovah's Witness means that you're not allowed to celebrate Christmas and you also don't celebrate your own birthday. So this must have been extremely hard for Rena, seeing all of the kids growing up, having all of these birthday parties, inviting each other on these special occasions. And being so young, she probably could not understand why all of these other kids were having fun and celebrating with each other but she just couldn't do the same. I can only imagine how unfair this could seem to a young child. Basically, they have to watch all of their friends have fun while they're forced to sit on the sidelines. Almost immediately after she began elementary school, Rena was being bullied and it was sad. She was different because essentially she was not Caucasian. She looked different than the rest of the kids and she was basically punished socially for this. This is something, sadly, I can attest to growing up in the early 90s, predominantly in a white area of Canada. The bullying was absolutely insane. While I did get a taste of it, I did not get the worst of it, which I'm still extremely thankful for. But I can agree and I can talk about what it is like to be ostracized for simply being a different color than the rest of the kids in your class. Kids, whether they know it or not, will say horrendous things to each other and they will bully other kids who they deem different or weird, not fully realizing how this is going to affect that particular child, not just in that moment, but also later on in life. So sadly, this was a daily occurrence for Rena. They made it known to her that she just did not belong. And aside from making fun of her appearance, they also made fun of her race her beliefs, 
and kids would physically bully her. It got to the point where sometimes they would put chewing gum in her hair, forcing Rena to chop some of it off. But that wasn't it. They also would make fun of Rena's weight, which as a young girl, especially growing up in the early 90s and 2000s, when someone makes fun of your weight, it is completely detrimental to your self-esteem. And this is something that played a big role in Rena's later years because it severely affected her confidence levels to the point where she just could not push the haters away. She could not ignore them. And it actually forced her to become quite introverted. Rena's parents noticed that their daughter was changing. Her personality was not as bright as it once was. And she was just sad all the time. So they got worried that she was falling into depression and they ended up changing her schools in 1994. Initially, it seemed like it was working. Rena was in a brand new environment. She was actually making friends. She was working on her social skills. But unfortunately, she had this one particular friend that she thought she was getting along with. But for some odd reason, and it's not fully explained, this friend chose to randomly just shun Rena. And this was said to have basically broken her heart. It really affected her self-esteem and it basically put her right back where she had started. In 1996, Rena then went on to complete elementary school, which meant it was now time for her to start a new phase of her life, which is middle school. And again, being in a new environment, Rena saw this as a brand new opportunity for her to make some new friends. And this time it worked. She had met a group of kids that were deemed to be the popular kids who did all sorts of things that they were not necessarily supposed to do at that age. I'm sure we can all relate to this. There was always a clique in high school or middle school that were deemed as being popular. And we all knew that these kids were always up to stuff that the rest of our parents would just would not allow us to do. So these kids would be having parties, they would stay out late, some would drink and use illegal substances as well. And while all this seemed like fun in games, it was actually quite dangerous. As an outsider, Rena wanted so desperately to be part of the cool kids club. And she also wanted freedom. She wanted to have fun. She wanted friends. And every day that she had to go to school with these kids, it was a reminder that they had everything and they were everything that she was not. So throughout middle school, she's getting older. She's also going through puberty at this age. But for Rena, it was also a very hard time. She was quite tall, approximately 5'8". So she was a lot taller than the rest of the kids at her age. And she also weighed about 200 pounds, which she went on to express was a huge insecurity for her. She felt like she was much bigger than the rest of the girls. And she also had more body hair, which is really sad because she felt like she simply felt like the complete opposite of what Western beauty standards are, which is something no girl should ever feel. I, again, can also relate to this. I did not look like the rest of the girls in my class. I did have dark hair. I had a little bit more body hair than the rest of them. And they let you know, they let you know that you look different than them. They let you know that you are not considered part of the group because you're just not like the rest of them, which is really mean. And again, I don't understand how these kids don't fully comprehend what they're saying or doing at that age. But again, unfortunately, this is something that the kids at her school took advantage of and they definitely did not let her forget this. So again, at middle school, Rena started acting out towards her parents and apparently she had actually ran away from home in the past and also started talking back to them, which was completely out of character for them. I guess this was a combination of her being fed up with her parents for being extremely strict with her and also wanting to have the same level of freedom as the cool kids in order to have some sort of social life. She also started hanging out with some of these cooler kids, which led to her participating in some of the same activities that all of them were doing. Her parents, especially her father, disapproved of her new friend group. And her father was also known to say that bad associations spoil useful habits. It seemed like the strict rules Rena's parents had placed on her were starting to backfire. 
Rena was getting older. She wanted more life experience. She wanted to be relatable to the other kids in her school, and she just couldn't do that living her life as a Jehovah's Witness. Then things took a very dark turn, and Rena did something that her parents were absolutely not expecting from her. So I guess hanging around all of these kids really did have a big influence on Rena. She was kind of impressionable. And so she started expressing to them how unhappy she was living at home, how strict her parents were, how she wasn't allowed to do anything. So then in 1996, when Rena was just 13, one of these new friends of hers gave her some terrible advice. She goes on to tell Rena that if she truly wanted to get away from her family home, then she should just tell police that she was being abused. They then would then take her out of the home and place her with the foster family. And Rena, not fully understanding the consequences of this, actually did this. Of course, an investigation was done, but because Rena was lying about this, there was no evidence for the case to move forward, so everything just stopped. However, this didn't just go away for Rena and her family. This ended up causing quite a lot of problems. Rena's grandparents believed her side of the story and ended up taking her into their home. But then it got even worse. Rena told them that her father had been sexually abusing her. And this came completely out of left field and honestly crossed the line that most people would not be able to come back from. In 1997, this led to Rena's father being arrested and put in jail. Obviously, he denied all of the accusations. He denied doing anything wrong. But fortunately, police do have to look into these things, especially when there's a serious accusation like this one. And especially because there is a child involved as well. So police did have to look into this, but eventually Rena ended up admitting to the police that she had lied and her father was released. In a book that her father ended up writing later on, he went on to explain that he felt like his daughter was easily manipulated, not just by her peers, but by the social workers and by her extended family as well. After Rena realized that spreading lies about her father just was not working, she started to say that she was uncomfortable living with her grandparents and told social workers that she wanted to be placed in a foster home. Surprisingly, this ended up working, but it also backfired at the same time because although Rena got the freedom that she was seeking, she also ended up getting into a lot more trouble. So she starts going out more, she starts meeting new friends, but she also starts acting out and doing all sorts of irresponsible things that these other kids were doing in order to fit in. However, this didn't last very long. She still had a curfew imposed on her and she was given chores, except she was living with strangers this time. And I guess to her, it ended up getting old pretty fast because it wasn't a free for all. It wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. It just didn't end up being the experience that she thought it was going to be. This then led to Rena apologizing to both of her parents and then eventually she ended up moving back in with them. But this was short-lived. It didn't take very long for Rena to realize why she wanted to leave her parents' home in the first place and it only pushed her to choose to live in a youth shelter before being taken over by government care once again. Then came November 14th, 1997, and Rena had chosen to stay the night at her parents' house. That same night, a friend of hers named Nicole Cook had invited her out to a party, which she was reluctantly allowed to go to as long as she came home by 11 p.m., which was her curfew. Her mother said that she really wanted Rena to stay home. They wanted to spend some time together, but she ended up giving in because her parents, although they were seeing that Rena was struggling socially, they wanted to give her a little bit more freedom. So again, reluctantly, they did end up letting her go to this party. The party in question was being held behind a local school known as the Shoreline High School with over 50 kids gathering. But when police caught wind of what was going on, they ended up breaking up the party and told everyone to go home. But of course, being teenagers, they didn't listen and they just moved a party to a different location, which ended up being underneath a bridge known as Craig Flower Bridge. At that party, there was a group of girls known as the Shoreline Six, along with a bunch of other students. 
One of these girls was Kelly Ellard, and she had a very long history of being a troubled teenager. In 1997, Kelly was only 15 years old when she began expressing interest in extremely vulgar rap music, serial killers, dangerous men, and it was later discovered that Kelly had a collection of extremely violent drawings in her school notebooks that included disembodied heads and severed hands. Kelly also happened to be friends with Rena's friend called Nicole Cook, and many of them shared the same problematic interests. All of these dark fantasies that the girls had would soon become reality when they set their eyes on Rena. Unbeknownst to Rena, Kelly and Nicole had actually been planning to have this party in order to lure Rena away from her home to an isolated location where there was going to be quote unquote a beatdown. So back at this party, it was reported that the teenagers were all drinking, they were smoking substances and just kind of being loud and reckless. Around 10:40 p.m., Rena called her parents and told them that she was going to be heading home soon and that she would be home by 11 p.m. Sadly, before Rena could leave the party, things got completely out of control. The first thing the girls did was get a hold of Rena's bus pass and tore it up immediately, taking away Rena's only way home. Then Nicole ends up approaching Rena and took one of her cigarettes and actually put it out on Rena's forehead. Suddenly, all of the girls rushed towards Rena and immediately started attacking her, throwing her to the ground, kicked her, punched her, and even stomped on her. Nicole then started yelling out at Rena, telling her that this was revenge for stealing her notebook and for spreading rumors about her, which unfortunately Rena had done. But that wasn't it. Apparently, on top of actually taking Nicole's notebook, Rena had gone through the entire book and had found a bunch of phone numbers that belonged to guys at the school. Rena then proceeded to call all of these guys and tell them that Nicole was ugly, that she had a few different diseases, that her eyebrows were fake. Apparently, she told them that she also had implants, which I agree if someone does this to another person, it is quite upsetting, but it did not warrant what these kids did to Rena. I can only imagine at this point, it must have clicked inside Rena's head while she was getting beat up by all of these kids that this entire party had been completely set up in order to do this to her and that Nicole had never actually been her friend. So as this fight continues, Rena is completely defenseless. It was way too many against one teenager. All she could really do in the first few minutes was say that she was sorry. She was heard yelling out, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But as the fight progressed, it was reported that many of the kids backed away or even ran away home. And some of them just stood there and watched. Eventually, one of the girls had some common sense kick into her and then she yelled out enough. Surprisingly, everyone listened to her and backed away and watched Rena just lay there motionless in the mud. She was bleeding, she was crying, she had a lot of pain and injuries, but absolutely no one bothered to help her. Somehow, Rena mustered the courage and the strength to get back up, and she started walking towards the top of the bridge to make her way home. Unfortunately, Kelly Ellard was not going to let that happen. Just as Rena was walking home in the dark, Kelly and another student named Warren Glowatsky who also had a very troubled life and was even known to be part of a gang, followed her where they stopped her and asked her if she was planning on telling on them. Of course, like anyone would say in this situation, Rena tells them no because she just simply wanted to get home. She didn't want to be there anymore. All she really cared about was her safety and getting better. However, these two students, Kelly and Warren, did not believe her and were not satisfied with what Rena had told them. It's reported that they then told her to lie down and likely out of fear, Rena complied. Warren then proceeded to kick Rena violently while Kelly grabbed Rena's head and smashed it onto a tree, which ended up knocking Rena unconscious. This part of the attack was estimated to have lasted about 15 whole minutes. They then both dragged Rena's body towards the body of water near the bridge where Kelly apparently held her head underwater. After a couple minutes, Rena regained consciousness and according to Warren, while he just stood there and watched, 
He said that Kelly started hitting her throat repeatedly, almost in like a karate chop motion, and then held her head underwater again until Rena drowned. After they had brutally killed Rena, the kids involved all made a pact to never talk about the events that, that evening. Fortunately, these kids just could not keep their mouths shut. On Monday morning at school, rumors quickly spread about what had happened that weekend and even teachers were hearing about this, but absolutely no one reported it to the authorities, which was incredibly frustrating. I have no idea why teachers would not speak up about this. I don't know why they wouldn't take these rumors seriously, especially when someone or a bunch of these kids are talking about someone losing their life over the weekend. And you know, for the most part where there is smoke, there's usually a fire. So even if the teachers didn't believe that someone had actually died, they must have figured or they must have known that something intense happened. So back home, Rena's parents were getting extremely worried and soon freaked out when Rena wasn't home that night and even more so the following morning. Of course, her mother starts calling her friends. She starts calling family or anyone that might have known Rena, but no one knew anything about her whereabouts. But that wasn't it. The next day, Nicole then returns to the crime scene and collected a bunch of Rena's personal belongings, took them with her in an attempt to conceal as much evidence as possible. Rena was then finally reported as missing, but police frustratingly did not take this seriously because unfortunately Rena did have a history of running away. So initially they thought that she was just another runaway. It would then take eight entire days for Rena's body to be discovered. And it was found approximately one kilometer away in the water, away from the bridge on November 22nd, 1997. We would later find out through the autopsy report that the injuries Rena sustained were comparable to someone in a violent car crash. To give you an idea, that's how badly Rena had been beaten, kicked, and stomped on. Eventually, and thankfully, eight teenagers were arrested, including Nicole, Kelly, and Warren. Nicole and five other girls were charged with aggravated assault, and Kelly and Warren were charged as adults and charged with murder. We would later find out that Warren didn't even know Rena. He just happened to be there at that party that night, and he had absolutely no reason to be involved or do anything that he did to Rena. Now, because all of these kids were underage, Nicole and the five other girls were prosecuted in a youth court where three of them right away pleaded guilty, but the three other ones were found guilty of bodily harm. And frustratingly, this is unbelievable to me, but all of them ended up serving various terms, but the max that any of them served was one year in a youth detention center. And this was partly for two reasons. During the autopsy, the coroner said that although Rena had been really badly beaten the first time around, it was the second incident where Kelly and Warren were responsible that actually ended up taking her life. So essentially, the six girls couldn't be charged with her murder. And second of all, all of these girls were still teenagers. They were between 14 and 15 years old. And in Canada, it is really hard to get tried as an adult unless you do something like what Kelly and Warren had done. But if you ask me, all of these girls should have been charged with murder for actively participating in Rena's death. And if that wasn't insulting enough to the family of Rena and to Rena herself, Nicole would later go on to state that she thought her sentence was quote unquote harsh and that she was in no way responsible for Rena's death. None of them had to do this to Rena for any reason whatsoever. Any one of these kids could have walked away. They could have called the police. They could have gone to an adult. They could have told literally anyone and gotten help, which is why I think all of them actively participated in Rena's passing. Now, during trial, Kelly wasted absolutely no time in accusing Nicole of being the leader and for being responsible for Rena's death. She went on to say that Nicole was the one responsible because she had all of these sick and twisted fantasies. And she also had the nerve to claim that she was actually being scapegoated by the rest of the kids, which ended up being a lie. The police were able to gather everyone's stories about that night, and the consensus was that Kelly was responsible and that she even gloated about it, saying that she had quote-unquote finished her off, 
And when she was confronted with all of this information, all she could say was, this is high school. It's just rumors, rumors, rumors. On the other hand, when it came to Nicole, she was surprisingly loyal to Kelly, refusing to incriminate her. Eventually, Warren was given a life sentence, but in 2010, he was paroled because he deemed to have been remorseful for what he had done. Although he apologized to Rena's family, they actually acknowledged and accepted his apology, which played a huge role in allowing him to get out of prison early, only after 10 years. But even so, I still think this is completely atrocious. Kelly's fate, however, was a little bit more complicated. In 2000, she was found guilty at her first trial where she portrayed herself to be as vulnerable, soft-spoken, and claimed that she had actually acted in self-defense. But unfortunately, it was overturned because she had been technically improperly questioned. So then in 2004, a second trial happens where she presented a completely different story and version of herself, rolling her eyes in court and repeated that she was not a monster, that she did not kill Rena. But because the jury was deadlocked, it resulted in a mistrial. Then again, in 2005, during a third trial, she was finally found guilty and sentenced to life with eligibility for parole after seven years. Unfortunately, I can hardly say that justice was truly served because not only did Kelly never accept responsibility for her role in Rena's death at the time, she just continued to express chaotic behavior in prison. But that's not it either. Kelly's parents also refused to accept that their daughter had anything to do with this. And they even claimed that Kelly never even knew Rena. So make of that what you will. So back in prison, Kelly had numerous infractions. She somehow got a hold of illegal substances and she was found to be making shivs out of toothbrushes. She also became pen pals with a man who was eventually allowed to come visit her for conjugal visits. And of course, as you could imagine, Kelly ended up getting pregnant not just once, but twice. And in 2017, she was granted day parole. It wasn't until then in 2017 that she finally admitted her involvement in Rena's passing. And she told a very different story. She claims that she had brought Rena to the shoreline in order to splash water on her face in order to wake her up. But when that didn't work, she said that she freaked out, she panicked, and so all she could really think to do was to push her body into the water. She continued to deny, though, that she held her head underwater because she said that Rena was already unconscious, so it wasn't necessary for her to do that. Of course, this is contradictory to what Warren had said, but the autopsy seems to back up his side of the story versus Kelly's. In August of 2021, her day parole ended up being suspended because she had breached parole rules, but then was reinstated again in March of 2022. And then in May of 2022, Kelly denied the chance for full parole because she claimed that she simply was not ready and she didn't really explain in detail. So as of fall 2022, her day parole remains in place and she also ended up changing her name to Carrie Sims. As for Rena's family, unfortunately and sadly, tragedy struck again in 2018 when Rena's mother, Suman Verk, passed away because of a freak accident, she was apparently at a restaurant, they were having dinner, and she ended up choking on a piece of food and sadly passed away. So it seemed like tragedy really did follow this family for a long and extended period of time, which I don't know how they dealt with, but I hope her entire family is doing well. And I hope we get to see more of their side of the story in this Netflix documentary that is going to be coming out, I think sometime next year. And that is the story of Rena Verk. Very upsetting and very frustrating to read and research, to be honest. I was very surprised that I didn't hear about this story sooner. It's very frustrating because a lot of this could have been prevented. You know, kids could have been nicer. There could have been a little bit more attention to Rena as well when she was going through all of these problems. Kelly and Nicole could have been dealt with in their own way, whether by their parents or the foster programs. I'm sad to see that justice was not fully served in this case. I don't really see how... Although these kids were younger, they were considered youths. I don't see how them serving up to a year max in youth detention center was any sort of justice. 
Although Warren did go on to kind of reform himself and talk about all of these things at high schools in order to prevent something like this from happening again, I still don't think him getting out after 10 years was fair. And same for Kelly. Although she did end up admitting some involvement, I do not see it as making sense that she was allowed to get day parole and to actually have kids of her own when she's proven to be a danger to society. All right, so let me know what you guys think in the comments below of this story. Do you think justice was served or not? And if you have any other case suggestions, leave them in the comments below. And don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, or even share this video. I am seeing a lot of new people here, which I am extremely thankful for. So if you guys wouldn't mind taking the time to do that, I would be extremely thankful. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you in the next episode.